Our opening hymn is hymn number 48. Hymn 48. Mm -hmm. O day of radiant gladness, O day of joy and light, O balm of care and sadness, most beautiful, most bright, this day the high and lowly through ages joined in tune. Sing holy, holy, holy to the great God triune. This day at the creation the light first had its birth. This day for our salvation, Christ rose from depths of earth. This day our Lord victorious, the Spirit sent from heaven. And thus this day most glorious, a triple light was given. This day God's people meeting His holy scripture here, His living presence greeting Through bread and wine made near. We journey on believing Renewed with heavenly might from grace more grace receiving on this blessed day of light. That light our hope sustaining, we walk the pilgrim way. At length our rest attaining, our endless Sabbath day. We sing to Thee our praises, O Father, Spirit, Son. The Church her voice upraises to Thee, blessed Three in One. Our service of Holy Eucharist, right, too, begins on page 358. Uh, through, I'm sorry, 355, page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings.
Our first lesson for today is from the book of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been tucked from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull, and stop their ears, and shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and comprehend with their minds, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate. Until the Lord sends everyone far away, and, the va and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm appointed for today is Psalm 138. We will read it responsively by half verse. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name. Because of your love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name. And your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord. When they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord. That great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The second lesson for today is Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It's from Paul's first letter. I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. First of all, as to one untimely born, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. 
Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory be to you, Lord Christ. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Now, reading from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Paul is very concerned with what's been passed down. Think about some bit of knowledge or um, uh, an ability or some wisdom that has been passed down to you from previous generations. I was watching this week a, a, an old show on PBS. It was an old woodworking show, and the fellow was really into hand tools rather than power tools. And so he was showing this special tool that was designed to cut a special kind of groove in a special kind of wood. <laughs> and uh, this is the kind of human culture that has been passed down from you know, worker to apprentice, from father to son, mother to daughter, um, throughout human history, right? These special tools, special ways of thinking, special ways of acting, uh, of understanding the world, they get passed down from generation to generation. And Paul is saying that the gospel is very much the same thing, that he received it from Christ and he's passing it on to these people, and they in turn, the, the Corinthians, will pass it on to others. And that's very much what's going on also with the readings I'd like to focus on today, particularly the reading from Isaiah. Um, it might seem strange to focus on a reading from, this is probably 2,000 plus another 700 years or so, 2,700 years ago, uh, as something that has been passed down to us. But it's amazing how this particular reading, this, uh, this appearance of God, this theophany, as we call it, um, still affects the worship that we do here every Sunday. We reenact this very reading, um, partly because it connects with other things that happen in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, and so on. Um, 
But this has been passed down to us, and we continue to pass it down to the Christians who come after us. And we'll see how it connects also with the gospel reading for the day. So look at uh, our first lesson, Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, says Isaiah, I saw the Lord. It's a year of transition, uh, a strange year. We know what it's like to live through strange times. Isaiah is doing the same thing. King Uzziah was mostly a good king. Um, he didn't do everything perfectly. He ended up being punished by God toward the end of his life. Uh, and had to have a regent rule for him. Um, he reigned for a long time, for over 50 years. Of course, yesterday, I believe, was the uh, 70th anniversary of the Queen of England's rule over England. Uh, and as head of the Church of England, we have a special relationship to Her Majesty. We should pray for her on the 70th anniversary of her reign. So King, uh, king Uzziah has died. A new king has come into place, and that's when Isaiah gets his vision. A special vision for a time of transition. He sees the Lord in the temple, sitting on a throne. This is an image of the throne room of God in heaven. He's high and lofty, and the, the, the hem of his robe fills the whole temple, which means that he himself is so much bigger even than, than the temple. Seraphs, these special angels that we always see around God's throne. Ezekiel sees them, and Daniel sees them. Uh, they're in attendance above him. And we get this, this description, which is how we know they're the same angels uh, that the other prophets see. They have six wings. And they sing the song that these angels are always singing. Every time we see them in the Bible, they sing this song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Just in that much, you can see how this connects to our worship today. Our worship spaces as Christians are designed around this image of God's throne room. The presence of God at the front, and we come and face it together. Uh, the angels in attendance above him, frequently in churches, you'll see images of angels in this area, especially the six-winged seraphs. Uh, often in... Uh, as we come to worship, we will sing this very song. We'll, we'll sing it ourselves, or at least say it today, since we don't have an organist. Uh, we will say this very song ourselves. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is our worship. It connects with this. It's this we're reenacting this same thing when we come to the, our liturgy. Uh, Isaiah immediately realizes that he is a sinful man. <laughs> Woe is me, he says. I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He, he realizes that not only is he himself sinful, he represents a sinful people before God as a prophet. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. The king here is not Uzziah. Right? The king is not whoever comes after him. He's realizing that there's a higher truth than politics, a higher truth than what's going on in his culture, that God is in control. This experience of seeing the presence of God in all its intensity is really what we are, what we've been passed down from previous generations and what we reenact here and what we pass down to others. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's understood that God, ha his presence has a certain kind of intensity now, that can be dangerous to those who are not either prepared for it or protected from it. And we can think about the sun. The sun is a big ball of nuclear-powered explosion going on all the time, right? And it's so intense we can't even look at it without damaging our eyesight. Um, but if you were to get close to the sun, the closer you get, the more likely what's going to happen? You're going to get burned, right? It's not because the sun is malicious or somehow dislikes you. It's not because the sun doesn't appreciate who you are or all that you're good at. Right? It's not because the sun uh, has some sort of uh, sense that we are unworthy of its presence. It's just because of the natural intensity of its heat and radiation. You get close to the sun, it will burn up. And so in the Old Testament, God is conceived of in this same way as a very intense presence. His glory is intense. 
in in the New Testament, we get a glimpse of this when Jesus is transfigured on the mountain and his his clothes become dazzling like lightning and his, his the intensity of his godhood starts to show forth. His glory is this intense, but so also is God's goodness. Imagine a goodness that's so intense that it, it radiates with this power that, that nothing can stand in its presence that isn't also that good. This is why in the Old Testament it, they constantly say uh, that God is so holy that he cannot look upon sin. Or they expect when, when they have a theophany like this, they expect that they will be burned up. Isaiah says, I'm lost, I'm dead. Because I don't deserve to be here. I'm not protected. I'm vulnerable to this intensity. Because I'm a sinful man. And God is holy. This is why God is constantly talking in the Old Testament about the rituals of cleanliness and uncleanliness. He gave them ways to protect themselves from this, the danger of the intensity of his presence. God wanted to live among his people. And yet, the people aren't worthy of it. And they're, because of that unworthiness, they're vulnerable to the intensity of, of who God is. And so the rituals of cleanliness and uncleanliness and of sacrifice all made it possible for God to live among his people. And that's what these angels are singing too when they say, holy, holy, holy. Anything in the Bible that's repeated is repeated for emphasis. And here this is repeated three times. It's the perfect number. It's the, the perfect emphasis. This is the perfect holiness, the ultra-intense holiness of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah is quick to recognize how vulnerable he is. He's not strong enough to withstand this. He's not good enough to deserve to be in God's presence. And he represents this society which also is not strong enough or good enough to be in God's presence. We get a similar thing in our gospel reading. Did you notice that? After Peter has seen the, the miracle of the fish from the lake, he falls down at Jesus' feet and says, strangest thing, right? Go away from me, Lord. You'd think if someone could give you such a financial windfall as that, you'd want them to be around you more often. But no, go away from me, Lord. Because I'm a sinful man. He has the same sense that he's in the presence of an intense holiness that makes him vulnerable and which he does not deserve. When we come to the liturgy of the Holy Sacrament, of the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, we have this same sense. If you look at the prayers that we pray and the way that we approach this sacrament, there's a reason we do all the things that we do before we come up to the altar. There's a reason we don't do that first. Right? Because we have to go through these same protocols and rituals to make sure that we're approaching it correctly. Because even in the New Testament, even in the, in the, the age of the early church fathers, they are very careful about what goes on at this altar. And we need, to, we need to approach it the same way Isaiah does with a sense, and Peter does as well, with a sense of our own unworthiness. That's why we do our confession of sin before we get to the altar. That's why we have the peace, the passing of the peace, before we get to the altar. That passing of the peace is not just a time to shake hands and be sociable. It's a time to make sure that you are at peace with everybody in the place. That you don't have anything against them. You're not angry with them. They're not angry with you. You haven't sinned against them. They haven't sinned against you. Right? And we're supposed to take that so seriously. St. Paul says that if we have, someone has, Jesus says this actually, if someone has something against us, leave your gift at the altar. Go be reconciled before you come to the altar. Paul says the same thing. We, we eat and drink unworthily and it becomes a danger to us. Paul even says to the Corinthians, this is why so many of you are getting sick. And even dying, because you're not taking the sacrament of the Lord seriously as his very presence, as this intense holiness and goodness living in us. And this is why we treat this altar space with a special, um, we treat it specially. We don't go up into this space generally unless we have business there. So the altar guild will go up. But you notice the altar guild doesn't just go up there to be sociable and dance a jig, right? They go up there when they have business, and then they come out. Same thing with me as a priest. I don't go up there unless I have business up there, and then I come back, right? 
in the uh, Orthodox churches, they have, of course, a, an icon screen here that keeps the congregation from going to the altar space for that same reason, because of the intensity of the holiness of the sacrament, the presence of Christ. Um, there's this, this twin impulse to both want people to come to Christ, but at the same time to realize the intensity and the danger of it. And this meets together when we come up to the Eucharist, when we reach our hands across that altar rail. Or it's almost like we're approaching a bonfire. Have you ever had a big bonfire in the backyard or at a park or somewhere like that? And um, It's so big that you can't get too close to it because you get too hot. But somebody has to go and poke that thing every so often. <laughs> This is the way I think about being a priest, right? Being a priest is not something to uh, boast about or brag about. It's really, it's, you're the guy who's been deputized on behalf of the group to go up close to the fire and poke it and make sure it's okay, right? It's that kind of intensity that happens with the sacrament. That as your priest, I'm the one who has to go up there and be close to it. And because of that, I, I take my own preparations seriously. The preparations of prayer, the preparations of uh, my own confession of sin before I come here to this altar. Um, and I take your preparation seriously too, because there is an intensity to this sacrament. It is the presence of God living among us, in us. But that's not where this experience for Isaiah ends. It goes on. When he realizes how sinful he is, that he's a person of unclean lips, and he represents a community that's unclean, something unusual happens. The normal pattern here would be for God's intensity to wreak havoc on those that can't withstand it. And Isaiah knows that's the pattern. Isaiah knows that's what he should expect. But instead, one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. Even the seraph won't touch it with his own hands, right, because of the intensity. And if you think about a coal, a coal is... A coal carries all the intensity of the fire. It can start a whole fire itself. Right? It carries all of the intensity of that fire, but it can be moved from place to place. So this angel is taking that intensity, the full intensity of God, and touching Isaiah's lips. It's like kissing the sun, right? Or kissing a bonfire. It should cause him to burn up. But instead, it's, the angel says, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Normally what happens when something corrupt touches something clean, ritually clean or incorrupt in the Bible, normally it's the corruption that gets communicated. Normally it's the evil that spreads from thing to thing. Uh, and so if you read the, the rules in Leviticus, if something dead or something rotten or something unclean touches a holy thing, that holy thing has to be re-cleansed, re-sanctified before it is used in the presence of God. But here the pattern works opposite. Here it's the holiness of God that gets communicated to the unholy, corrupt being. Here God is taking the initiative to spread his holiness into the world so that his word can be heard. That's the opposite of what Isaiah expects. It's an experience of what we might call grace, undeserved favor. God knows Isaiah is sinful. God knows the people that he represents are sinful. And yet, God has a purpose toward redemption for this people. And so he spreads his holiness to Isaiah, sanctifies his lips so he can proclaim the message. You see the same sort of thing going on with Peter. Uh, wrecking, having recognized his own sinfulness before Jesus, expecting from this holy man a, a message of judgment, or Peter, you need to clean yourself up, make yourself holy. And instead, Jesus just says, Ah, oh, come with me. I want you nearer to me. Come with me, and I will make you a fisher of man. I will use you to accomplish. God's work in the world. This is a call toward, that sets Peter on the, the path as a disciple. It sets him on a path toward holiness. Right? Peter doesn't stay a sinful man. He's on the path toward sanctification so he can stop being a sinful man. Um, he doesn't, as we know from, if you know any of the stories about Peter, uh, he doesn't get it right for a long time. <laughs> this is a process. 
But Jesus is patient with the process. So this is a path toward sanctification. This is a path toward Peter's salvation. And it's a path toward his own glory where he becomes the head of the disciples, a leader in the church. And someone still look back on today as, as a sign of the glory of God in people, in his holy church. If you've been to Rome and seen the Basilica of St. Peter, it's hard for this, it's hard to connect that glory to the sinful man in his boat that we read about today. But what happens in between is Jesus and his transforming mission. So it is also the same thing with us. When we come to this Eucharist, we come to receive the presence of God, this intense holiness in us. It starts with confession. It starts with the peace. We're at peace with God. We're at peace with each other. And having recognized our sinfulness, then we can approach the intense holiness of God. Not because we deserve it. Not because we've cleaned ourselves up and made ourselves worthy. But because we've recognized our sinfulness ready for God to reach out and touch us and make us holy. We reach across the altar rail, but that's not the first reaching. The first reaching is God himself reaching across to us to call us forward. I want you to be near me, just like he did with Peter. It doesn't matter how sinful you are. It doesn't matter. You're not going to be spiritual enough to deserve it. You're not going to be holy enough to deserve it. You're not going to be pious enough to deserve it. You're not going to be righteous enough to deserve it. Never and ever. God knows that, but he wants you near him anyway. And so he reaches out to you to draw you forward, and you come forward and reach out to him and receive his presence. It's beautiful. And it's a step toward sanctification. And he knows it's a process. He understands it's a process with us. He's starting the process for us. But he's patient with the process. And he makes us what he wants us to be. But this is still not the end of the story. Right? Isaiah gets a message to preach to the people of Israel. He's experienced God's intensity. He's experienced God's grace. And now he gets the message. And the message is kind of counterintuitive. Um, we know that God wants people to hear his message, that he wants people to understand. And yet, here's the message he gives to Isaiah. Go and say to this people, y'all listen, but you don't understand. Y'all keep looking, keep trying, but you're not going to see it. Make the mind, he's, he's, at, he's telling Isaiah to make, the, the Hebrew is make the heart of this people fat. Imagine someone you know, a lazy couch potato sitting on the couch doing nothing but watching television. His mom comes and says, you need to get up and get some exercise, <laughs> right? <laughs> but the person is so dull and sluggish from being sedentary that we don't want to, I'm talking from my own experience, we, do, we don't want to get up and get the exercise that we need to be healthy and wholesome, right? Because this sluggishness has a way of snowballing in our lives. Right? And it takes a lot of effort to overcome it. That's what he's pointing at here. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy. Make, and shut their eyes. So that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn or repent and be healed. God's not telling Isaiah to make it harder for people to be saved. What he's saying is that when you preach the message of repentance, this is the response you're going to get. You're going to get the response of people whose, whose inertia is toward their sinfulness. And it's hard to get them rolling in the other direction. People who are sluggish and don't want to get up and change. You're going to get people to stop their ears because they don't want to hear what you have to say. You're going to get people who close their eyes, not because they can't see, but because they don't want to see what's true, and what needs to change. And the word here is turn, or return, and repent. Turn again, because that's what they need to be healed. You have to know what your sins are so that you can repent of your sins, change and turn, and then be healed. That's the process. That's what God wants to happen. But we as sinful human beings, we don't like to hear it, right? Uh, we are the ones whose hearts are fat and sluggish, slow to hear and understand, unwilling to repent. And so we often miss out on God's offer of healing. 
Peter's commission is very much like this also. When, when Jesus says he will fish for men, now, if you've ever been fishing, you know that the basic truth of it is that the fish don't want to be caught. <laughs> uh, many of, most of the fish do go uncaught, and, and none of them want to be caught. It's, it's sort of a battle of wills between the fish and the fishermen, right? And this also can be a sign of the preaching of the gospel. The world around us doesn't want to hear that it needs to repent. It doesn't want to hear about its sinfulness. It doesn't want the light shined upon itself. Uh, Paul says the, the world hates light because it loves darkness. It loves its sinful and evil and shameful works. We see this worked out in the national news just about every day, right? Some new scandal, some expose, some secret uncovered. The powerful people prefer to be hushed up. As sinful people, we dislike the truth, even if it will ultimately lead to health and wholeness and a wholesome society. But the process of getting there, the inertia of stopping us from rolling one way and starting us fat and sluggish as we are, rolling the other way, that's the hard part. And we prefer to cover up our wrongdoing, and it's hard to get over that initial hurdle of discomfort to reach the point of confession, repentance, forgiveness, and restoration, which is really what God wants. So this Eucharist also has the same effect on us. The reason we go through our confession of sin and our peace, passing the peace to one another, is so that we get used to this kind of inertia. Right? We get used to changing from sluggish to active, from rolling towards sin to, to being rolled back in the other direction toward righteousness. Right? This is practice for us because we need it. We are sinful. We still sin. We do wrong things. We need this practice of turning from sin to righteousness, from sluggish to active, from, from unhearing to hearing. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the world around us is the same way. It, it, its heart is fat. Its ears are heavy. Its eyes are closed. People's souls are vaccinated, as it were, against the love of God that would forgive them, heal them, and make our world wholesome again. But this is our commission, to stand here and do this sacrament, to be called as representatives of our sinful people. We get called. God wants us near him. He wants the whole world near him. He's reaching out to us. We get to reach out to him and take this intense presence of Christ into us and back out into the world. We get it. We, we understand why people don't like this, because that's our own experience. We experienced it with our own salvation. We experience it every week with confession. And we experience it as a part of our own walk of discipleship. So when we pray the words of the collect for the day, which we'll pray in just a moment, remember that we're putting ourselves as representatives of the human community. We pray this not only for our own lives. We are people of sinful lips. We pray for our church, for our diocese, for our society, for the whole human world that needs God's presence, that God wants to have close to itself, right? This is a prayer for the restoration of that relationship. Set us free, O oh God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand as we proclaim our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which is found on page 358 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people are form one from the Book of Common Prayer, beginning on page 383. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, for Christians undergoing persecution, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Brian, our bishop-elect, Paul, our assisting bishop and the standing committee, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nation, for all in authority, and for all who serve our country, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city, for every city and community, for those who live in them, and for all those who protect us, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who especially desire our prayers, especially Alex, Robert, Grant, Anna Claire, Adam, Andrea, Barbara, Jared, Joe, Elaine, Susan, Lori, Julie, Nancy, Shalice and family, Kim, Gary, Ron, Chris, Jesse, Penny, Ben, Ted, Kathy, Father Wildy and his father, and Betsy. Are there others? Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Bob, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Michael, and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another to all our life, to Christ our God. To thee, O Lord our God. 
Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Uh, our offertory hymn is hymn number 377, which if someone would like to lead a cappella, you certainly may, you'll recognize the tune. It is the tune of our doxology. Uh, but this is, uh, if you'll indulge me for a moment as, as a liturgical historian, um, this tune, Old Hundreds, used to be the tune for the 100th Psalm in John Calvin's Psalter from the 1500s. Uh, so this goes way back to the, the second generation of the Reformation. Um, and then this tune had got connected to our doxology, and so we sing it a lot. But this is the English version of the original text of that tune. It's a, it's a paraphrase of Psalm 100. Uh, so our offertory hymn is number 377. And if someone wants to lead it now, you can. Otherwise, I'll lead us in it after I'm done with the tape.
Our great Thanksgiving is Eucharistic Prayer B, found on page 367. But first, let's sing the uh, doxology using the same tune we just sang as our offerings come forward. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All things come of Thee, O Lord. And of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Eucharistic Prayer B. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. 
We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Michael the Archangel, and with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah! Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
body of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep you in everlasting life. The body of Christ. Our communion hymn is hymn number 537, 537, it's a familiar one. If, you, if someone would like to lead it now, you may, otherwise I will lead us in a couple of verses when I finish at the table. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with loving zeal, the poor and them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow worn, whom Christ doth heal. Verse 4. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with joyful song, the newborn souls whose days reclaimed from error's ways, inspired with hope and praise, to Christ belong. Well done. Our prayer after communion is found on page 365 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Please be seated for the announcements. I wrote down a number of announcements to give to you today and forgot to bring my little sheet up here. So I wonder if, Anne, would you be willing to come up and say a few words about some of the things that you're involved in? Would you, uh, would you tell us about the outreach committee meeting and the uh, fellowship committee, fundraising committee meeting?
Anne, can you come up? Anne, can you come up to the microphone, please? So the, so the, yeah, the people online need to hear as well. That's all right. Next week is Super Bowl, as you all know, and the contest is on. I think you all got an email. Uh, what we'd like you to do next Saturday or Sunday is bring your cans of soup or your donations so that we can distribute them and, and be part of the competition. We are past winners four times. We'd like to be a fifth time. So, uh, and Nels will be back, so he'll be glad to have your donations. They can come on Saturday if you're not comfortable coming on Sunday. Just give us a call and we'll meet you at the church and bring uh, the donations in. So that brings us, uh, and next week is of course the outreach meeting. The following week is our fundraising meeting. We have usually three fundraisers a year. We like your ideas. We'd like you to come and be part of it. And obviously, we all know what March 1st is. It's Pancake Day. So the first thing we'll be doing is the flyer has been created. We're going to be emailing that out to you this week. We encourage you to be part of this project by just forwarding that email or forwarding the flyer to your friends that are on your email. Not just, we'll see it on Facebook as well, but um, this way we can get more people. We will have carry out. That might be a much bigger function this year, um, so we need your help. Bill has done a lot to make um, this particular event COVID safe his, in his planning. So we will um, be working on that. We would love for you to all help us that night. Starting from, four, it, it will run from about four to seven. And um, hopefully we'll come close to what we've had in the past. We'll put less, probably less chairs at each table to separate people, but the carry out is gonna be a big function. So if you would please uh, put that in your calendar Tuesday, March the 1st, 4 o'clock, and certainly be part of the fundraising meeting on the 20th, is it the 20th? The 20th. 20th, um, to help us not only plan, finalize that function, but plan some new and future events that we're in a process of change now. This is a good time for us to try some new things, and we have some new ideas for this year. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all part of all these ministries, outreach and fundraising. And I uh, hope you'll come out to all the meetings and help us on the first. Thank you, Ann. That's a lot to be put on the spot for, and I appreciate you coming up to do that. But if you can tell, this is why we need committees. We used to have a number of functioning committees that helped run the church. And through COVID, most of those have not been able to meet. And, but uh, the work has been kept going by a few really faithful volunteers, and Ann has been one of those. And, Yasmin and there have been others as well. Um, so what we need is we need the committees to start working again. We're to the point where we can start getting these groups back together and, and, and uh, generating ideas and planning how things are going to work. And, um, all this doesn't have to be done by the mission leadership team. It can be done in the committees, which are much more accessible and easier to get things done. So please do come to the outreach committee meeting next Sunday, the 13th, after church and then the fundraising committee the following Sunday, February 20th, um, to help with those meetings. Thank you. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Yes. Uh, yes, or you can use the pulpit as well. It's easier. So it's great to see everybody. Um, I just wanted to share with you, you've been praying for my niece, Carrie. Um, she is 45 years old and was diagnosed with AML in July. She has since had a bone marrow transplant and she is in remission. So I just really want to thank you for your prayers. I know they work. Uh, she dealt with uterine cancer two years ago and survived that. We're not sure why this is going on with her. Um, we do have the cancer gene in our family. so. Um, I just continued prayers for her. She, she is a hard worker. Um, she doesn't like being at home, and she has to be isolated for another six months. But I just wanted to share with you that she is in remission. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank, thanks be to God.
not, then our final hymn is hymn number 401, hymn number 401. The God of Abraham praise, who reigns enthroned above, ancient of everlasting days, and God of love. The Lord, the great I am, by earth and heaven confess. We bow and bless the sacred name forever blessed. He by himself hath sworn, we on his oath depend. We shall on eagles' wings upborne to heaven ascend. We shall behold his face, we shall his power adore, and sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. There dwells the Lord our King, the Lord our righteousness, triumphant o'er the world and sin, the Prince of Peace. On Zion's sacred heart, his kingdom he maintains, and glorious with his saints in light forever reigns. The God who reigns on high, the great archangels sing, and holy, holy, holy cry, Almighty King, who was and is the same, and evermore shall be. Eternal Father, great I am, we worship Thee. The whole triumphant host give thanks to God on high. Hail Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they ever cry. Hail Abraham's Lord divine, with heaven our songs we raise. All might and majesty are thine, and endless praise. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.